I'm Dr. Trevin Hatch, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have a New Testament scholar on the show. His name is Dr. Trevin Hatch, and he teaches at BYU. He's a Jewish studies scholar, and he's got a fantastic new book called A Stranger in Jerusalem. And so we're going to talk a lot about uh, Jesus Christ's scholarship from a Jewish perspective. Um, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get into the Christmas story uh, here with December uh, coming up and Christmas. So I'm going to really encourage you guys, if you want a really good scholarly book, A Stranger in Jerusalem is something that you should put under your Christmas tree. So it's a great, great book. And let's get acquainted with Dr. Trevin Hatch. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have an amazing Jewish scholar right here at BYU. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? I'm Dr. Trevin Hatch. Um, not a Jewish scholar, Jewish studies scholar. Okay. We know what you meant, but some people are like, oh, you got a Jewish scholar at BYU? Yeah, scholar of Jewish studies, trained by trained to, to read the New Testament by Jews. I studied at multiple Jewish universities, three uh, Jewish uh, institutions of higher learning, and been to, including in Israel, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to take what I learned from Jews and then apply it to, uh, to the scriptures. Well, I'm excited because you've got a really interesting academic background. Because um, you've been, you've got more education than anybody I know, I think, right? It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, the short of it is... After I left BYU, I went to a Jewish university in Baltimore. Okay, so you got your undergraduate at BYU. Uh, yep, in, in ancient Near Eastern studies, and yeah. then I switched to history and pulled my ancient Near Eastern studies courses over there. So, minored in Hebrew, you know, did all that. Then I went to Baltimore Hebrew University uh, in Baltimore. It's a, it was fantastic. It's a small Jewish university, Jewish faculty, mostly Jewish students. I lived in a neighborhood of 20,000 Orthodox Jews right there in North Baltimore. Uh, it was fantastic. So, and then um, I went, I, I didn't get into the PhD programs I wanted because this was right after the recession. So I came back to UVU, taught in philosophy for two years, philosophy, you know, ethics and values, taught some courses in religion and Judaism. And then uh, I was frustrated because I couldn't get into the PhD programs I wanted to with funding. This is in ancient studies, the world of the Bible and Jewish studies. So I then searched nationwide for somebody who could help me continue to study Jews and religion from any aspect. It could be political science, you know, whatever. And I found this guy at LSU in the bayou. You probably can see behind you LSU. Go Tigers, the, right? Yeah, the Tigers. Uh, <laughs> he happened to be a Latter-day Saint, and he, was, he studied a Jewish, Christian, and Muslim family life. And so I thought, you know, and it was in the School of Social Work. So I thought, how, how, I don't know how I'm going to make this transition to the social sciences. Um, especially in a school of social work where I'm not going to become licensed. And a lot of my professors are not social workers. They're, they're sociologists and economists and political scientists and education scholars. And so it's kind of an interdisciplinary background where I wrote my dissertation on American Jews. And then while I was doing that program, I started a second doctorate in Jewish studies at the Spurtis Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago. It's a long time. It's kind of like Brandeis. Now, wait a minute. Are you going to LSU and Chicago at the same time? Yeah, yeah, at the same time. <laughs> Uh, it, it was crazy, but I, I just kind of, it sounds nuts, but I had some funding and uh, I, I just considered both of those programs as a kind of one doctoral training. Wow. Right, this thing. So I'm a trained social scientist um, who, you know, I, I raise questions that social scientists tend to care about and I apply it to the ancient world. Questions like the geopolitics and how the populace, you know, relates to the power structures and like, in this case, the temple establishment in Jerusalem, uh, the temple. And so... It's fun to kind of go back and forth um, on those topics. So, yeah, I was running both PhD programs at the same time, one in Jewish studies, one in social sciences. And then I came to BYU and I got a job in the library. And I, at first I thought, this is kind of hokey, like a library. Like I did all the stereotypes of a librarian. I thought, you know, even my sister said, you went and got two doctoral degrees to be a librarian. And, um, yeah, I guess uh, it's, a, it's the best-kept secret in academics. I have research time. I have faculty status. I, you know, I, I, all day long, I'm e if I'm dealing with students or faculty or collection development, it's all, like, it's all in biblical studies, religion, uh, Jewish studies, and things I care about. So after I came here, they wanted me to get a second master's degree because it was part of the job of Master's of Library Science. They paid for it, so I had to do that. That's... 
Anyway, so, so eventually... two PhDs wasn't good enough. You had to go back and get a master's. Uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's <laughs> embarrassing. It's fine. Yeah. You know why this is embarrassing? That, that, uh, and we can cut this if it's a tangent, but... We, we're uh, into tangents here. <laughs> and by the way, my name twin, Dr. Richard Bennett, majored in library science. So you're in good company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the reason why I mention it's kind of embarrassing, and it's even something... We, it's strange. The, the, the culture that we live in now, the LDS culture, there's a... There's a strong, ultra-conservative segment of that, right? You think? Yeah, yeah. And those, and in our, in our culture, the, the, the discussion that's swirling is it's, anti, it's anti-academia. It's not necessarily anti-learning, uh, and you know, but it's anti-academia. Anti-expert. Yeah, and I've had people tell me, like on uh, social media and elsewhere, like oh you're oh you you're a social scientist you got trained in social science and in Jewish studies of religion all of that is like ultra liberal and you must be a Marxist because Marxism is at the, the foundations of the social science and and they just dismiss like whatever you have to say they just dismiss it assuming you're this like raging liberal who has an agenda and you know so it's um we're learned because we, th- we you know or we think we're wise you know. So uh, there's that, you know, it's, it's not like we tend to be the boogeyman sometimes. <laughs> so it's not like it's always like, oh, there's a scholar. They can tell like, no, you have to make your argument very, very well. And even the stuff that we're going to talk about today, if I don't make it well enough and uh, people don't read the book and I don't articulate, this will be difficult because there's so many details. We can't possibly get into it. And I can't remember everything that if I'm sloppy with the argument, some people just dismiss it. Right. You know, they'll just say, let's sloppy because here's this verse that counters Dr. Hatch. You know, so it, it really is, sometimes we're caught yeah, between a rock and a hard place of how we engage this, these topics at BYU. You know, because we're too fluffy and simplistic uh, in our writing or our teaching. And then the outside world, both, both more liberal Latter-day Saints uh, and ex-Mormons or outside the Mormon uh, body, they'll look at us and be like, those guys aren't serious. But then if we do real serious scholarship and sink our teeth in and, and, you know, especially in Bible proper, well, then we run the risk of making all the ultra-conservative people who believe every aspect of the Bible is literal, we, we risk making them look, them, them getting mad at us. So it's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we are definitely pro-expert here on Gospel Tangents. So <laughs> I love this because I've never... So the, the book we're going to talk about is your book, A Stranger in Jerusalem. I've never seen any Latter-day Saints, I almost said Mormons, I almost sinned, um, any Latter-day Saints put the kind of amazing scholarship in this book as, as you have done. And I love that book. So why don't you, why don't you show everybody uh, the, the book here? Um, you guys should all get it for Christmas. <laughs> You can plus what we're New Testament we're studying. Come follow me. So uh, we're we're going to definitely talk about a lot of that fun stuff. So. And it's since I picked it up, I've just it's just the back story of this. The, I got this is a, a religious studies press. It's not it's not I didn't write this to Latter Day Saints. It's Whip and Stock. It's a Christian religious studies press. They've got different imprints. Some of them are academic. Some are written for children. But this is in the imprint um, that is for academic but written to a uh, large audience right lay audience right and so i, I what i did is i i mean because we have thousands of books on jesus mm-hmm. historical jesus right and so what i what i when i brought the proposal i said I'm, I'm a latter-day saint who's writing about jesus from a jewish studies perspective and we don't have any latter-day saint scholars engaging the larger community uh with with the Jesus traditions. There's a lot of people here at BYU who do that. I said, but we have Catholic scholars, there's Muslim scholars, with Reza Aslan, we have a lot of Jewish scholars, uh, atheists, Catholic scholars who have books where we can see how they're interpreting the Jesus traditions. We have no Latter-day Saints, uh, unless they come into Latter-day Saint presses and look at it. So I said, this gives people a chance outside of my community to see how Latter-day Saints, or at least me, engages with the, the historical Jesus research. So they took it, and um, so it's, it's a fun. And then in the, the back, like I've got uh, Peter Haas, professor of Jewish studies emeritus at Case Western Reserve, Victor Myrlman, he's Hebrew University and a rabbi in Chicago, and Leonard Greenspoon, the Klutznik Chair of Jewish Civilization at Creighton. So I know all these people. And um, I could have gotten a Latter-day Saint scholar, but I wanted, uh, I, I don't mention anything about, uh, I don't quote any 
restoration stuff in here. Not that I'm ashamed of it, but that, that's, that was the backstory. That's the goal of the book. Okay, and so so you're writing this to a general Christian audience, not just an LDS audience, is that Christian, right? Jewish, yeah, um, yeah. Enthu- what do I say in the intro? Um, enthusiasts, you know, uh, non-specialists, but you know, a highly uh, highly interested, high interest but non-specialist audience. Yeah, because I noticed you quoted Josephus a ton. <laughs> it's really it's really with I, I I wrote it with undergraduates and beginning graduate students in mind, like my students at LSU when I taught at LSU. Okay. Christians, some non-Christians. <clears throat> so I pictured an eager group of upper-level undergrads or beginning grad students who, uh, who need more, you know, uh, about the culture and the Jewish culture in the background of the world of Jesus. So. Yeah, yeah. This, I, you know, it was funny because I... People who have listened to my podcast for a while, I know that I love the Jesus Seminar, and it took you until the last chapter to quote John Dominic Rosan. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, can you give me your opinion on the Jesus Seminar? Because they're kind of defunct now, aren't they? They're not really. Yeah, so yeah, the Jesus Seminar. This is um, this is a couple. I think they started a couple decades ago. Maybe yeah, three decades. I think they started in the '80s when I was on my mission. Three so. decades ago, and they're. they're they did a lot of good. They have a bunch of books where basically what, what you have is, uh, I don't remember how many, but it was a lot. There was a lot of scholars that would gather. And some of them were New Testament scholars, mostly Christian. And then they would have some random like scientists or armchair type scholars. And that was one of the criticisms of, of some people about the Jesus Seminar. Because they would, they would um, engage all the Jesus traditions, the deeds and sayings, and they would look at it from every angle. You know, they would do every year, they'd take a different uh, topic or approach. And then they would vote on whether Jesus really did say this or they did not say this. And they had a color system, like right, put the, you know, whatever, put the blue bead in this, if you think this episode is historical. And someone like Bart Ehrman, who's, uh, I don't know, agnostic atheist, I don't know what he calls himself nowadays, something like that. But he's Former evangelical. Former evangelical. He, you know, he... He'll say in passing, the Jesus Seminar uh, designated maybe 30, I, I don't remember, but something like 30% of Jesus' deeds and sayings in the, in the Gospels as historical. He says, I think it was 30%, but they got the wrong 30%. So, and then he has, you know, and he has got his whole method. So. Right. Uh, so I like I like. You this. didn't quote Ehrman, though. I don't remember him. Uh, I don't think you did. Don't I? I? I don't know. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. What I do in there, I, I quote a lot of... Um, First century, second century, you know, primary sources, and, I, and some of my reviewers said, "You, you quoted. Don't give me eight examples. Give me two examples, and then move on." And I, I, I don't know. I want to just, I, I want to just pour on. I want to give every possible example, so that people can see just how rich this is. Like I don't want to give two examples of Jesus using the Hebrew Bible, for example, in his teachings, or you know, or the Gospel of Matthew, the author of Matthew. I want to give like eight examples, you know. So it's not like six hundred pages. 250 if you don't count the back the right. back stuff right so well one of the coolest things is as we start into the book um and of course i'm gonna let you guide the conversation but one of the coolest things <laughs> and this doesn't have some well it has it has to do with jesus i was surprised you brought it up was goliath right right, right. How, how tall was goliath really because you know we think of him as being nine feet tall but no humans are nine feet tall. Except, I guess there was one who was like eight foot eleven. But I made it. I made my gospel doctrine teacher mad one year when I, she gave her whole spiel and I raised my hand. And I said, "This is a great lesson. Let me just if I can add a few things." And then I, I gave you know what, I, what we're going to talk about in a minute. But I gave it, and she's like, "Don't ruin the lesson," because her whole lesson was based on how big he was, and therefore you know nothing's too big for God to help us. Like there's the traditional like here's this huge guy who should have won the fight and he didn't, but. Yeah, we, we, you know, we can get to it. So th- that whole discussion was, and even one of my reviewers said, why are you discussing this, you know, D- Goliath? It's a, and it was just something that I like, and so I crammed it in, uh, you know. <laughs> so the context was, I was, we were looking at the day in the, in the life of a, a Jewish, you know, the, the, the social aspects of a Jewish life. And so we dealt with food and housing, you know, I get all that kind of stuff, like the agrarian lifestyle. And then I've got one section on uh, what did an average Jewish man look like? I mean, obviously, there's a range. It's too hard to like. Right. But were they tall? Were they big? Like, what, were, did they grow their facial hair? Did they shave it? You know, there's all kinds of different depictions. So I was kind of going through and saying, here's what we know. 
from archaeology. Lots of different tombs where they're, you know, they, they come across the tomb, like in Upper, Upper Galilee at Myron, and there's like 200 people buried in there from a family. So they test them all. How many male, how many female, how old are they? Do they die of diseases? And then there's other sites all around, dating to the first century all the way back to like the seventh century. And, and it's not just in Israel-Palestine area. It's all over the Mediterranean world that people have done these kinds of research. So we have, we have from Greece and Rome, like we have a lot of data on how big the population was, what their diet was, what they died of. Anyway, so I was talking about all that, and we, you know, come to the conclusion that the average male through all that was, you know, five and a half feet tall. Five, five. Five, right? five, 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 I know. Right? Right? five, five. It's really short now. And that was the average. And so, and there's some apocryphal things, uh, you know, the Gospel, uh, the Acts of John, or whatever, you know, the second century. I'm not, I'm not a early Christian, later early Christian scholar, so I'm not steeped in those texts. But I think it's the Acts of John that says he was small in stature. If it's true, you know, this is dated 150 CE or whatever. That he could have been five one or five two, and you know, who knows? But it doesn't appear that he's like taller. Like he's six feet and six, you know, whatever. He's not Be- like Joseph Smith, right? He was no, he was a tall guy. Because they didn't have this. I mean, and, and there's not a lot of evidence. I, I just use one piece where the guards come to Gethsemane, and they, right? They say, uh, Judas, which you're gonna have he? to yeah, you're gonna have to tell us which one he is, because you know, if he was this, this really strong, like sort of military, like ask person, they could just say it's the big guy, you know, it's the one who's, it's, it's the leader that's their big guy. Like, anyway, it's not strong evidence, but it, it gives us something to think about with the, the world of Jesus and, and you know, uh, what the rabbis, what they wore, their facial hair, and, you know, anything like that. So, I, I did talk about Goliath as a point of reference, because it's a similar Mediterranean world. And, yeah, in the early, in the, in the, the early manuscripts, he's four cubits in a span, which is, it could range from, you know, six, four to six, seven. It depends on, a, cu- a cubit is... That's me, right? I'm six, four, I'm Goliath. <laughs> yeah, me too, like six, four. So when I, when I take people to Israel on tours or whatever, and we go down to the, the Valley of Elah, I'll stand on my toes, and I'll give them a sling with some marshmallows, I'll say, okay, hey, I'm, I'm Goliath, like I'm six, on my toes, I'm six, six. So, you know, they sling them at me. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting, that whole story of, um, basically what happened is that, you look at the Septuagint, you look at the Qumran Bible, the copies of the, the early, you know, this is, these are predate Jesus, four cubits in a span. But once you get to the Masoretic text, later texts, um, he's now six cubits in a span, and he's like eight, nine feet tall, and uh, that, there's some monkey business going on there. And it happens all the time with it, within the text. So, you know, so that's... It's like it's, a fishtail, basically, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. It's a, it, and it's a perfect example of how this happens, you know, the, the, how, how things grow and change get embellished you know for, yeah it's shocking to me because to think that jesus could have been five two i'm just like really he was that i mean short short guy possibly yeah and, and my mother-in-law she's she's funny because she you know i says and isaiah says i don't use that as historical evidence but right. isaiah taught he has this thing where you know the messiah or a future figure or whoever he's talking about is is not going to be handsome and the word he uses is not going to be people won't will not desire him which is referring to sexual desire People won't look at, him, look at him in that way. Short, scrawny, whatever that means, uh, whatever that means at the time. And my mother-in-law says, no, I, I can't deal with that. i got to have a, a pretty Jesus. I can't have this, you know, uh, <laughs> dirty, unkempt, ugly, I don't know, whatever. You know. She's like, I, I, I can't do that. I have to have a strong. <laughs> so. Well, you know, with December coming up here and Christmas, um, you didn't spend a lot of time on the Christmas story, but I was wondering if you could share anything from the Christmas story uh, before we jump into the Gospels here. What do we get wrong with the Christmas story um, and that sort of a thing? Yeah, the Christmas, yeah, I don't spend a lot of time, but uh, I, I do have these discussions with uh, people in Jerusalem, like in, on, in Holy Land tours when we go there, we'll, we'll go to Bethlehem. Um, I don't want to deconstruct everything because it's a special sacred story, but I just give them nuances and, and talk about the image that we have of Joseph and Mary coming two people without a caravan, the route that they might have taken. You know, there's three different possible routes, but all of those are dangerous. They would have had a caravan. So we talk about all these issues of the, of the Christmas so story. So you think Jesus came on a, or Joseph came on a caravan? You have to be, yeah. There's no way you would have a woman who's eight months pregnant or however, however you know, whenever they went. The depictions are that she's nine months pregnant, ready to give birth. But even if we eliminate those you know, those social uh, reconstructions and, and movies and just take the text, 
it's, it appears that they're already there. It says, and while, I think in Luke, I don't remember all the, the, the references, but I think in Luke he says, and while they were there, it came time for her to give birth, right? So they'd been there, and then and you take different aspects. Mark, uh, Matthew says there's a house, Oikos, house available. So they would have known someone. They would have traveled in a caravan. They would have get set uh, down in their, you know, in their setting. They would have had a place, a house probably. And the word Cataluma does not mean an inn or like a hostel, because Luke does use a word like that, but it's a different word, like the inn of the Good Samaritan. Right. It's a different word. So Cataluma is like the guest house, like an upper room or a guest room, not a guest house, but a guest room. And so there's no space in the Cataluma, no space in the inn is what we translate, no space in the Cataluma, which means there's, there's the house is probably crowded. There's no space in the room that they would have stayed in. So they put them down on the bottom floor, probably back in a cave, because there's a lot of uh, Christian tradition of, of, being, of caves, a lot of caves in, around Bethlehem. So whoever they're staying with probably cleared out the bottom floor where the animals are kept in the back, where it's where you get the manger, right? It's where you get the feeding, like the gold, the, the, uh, the stone uh, manger. So that kind of setting, like I bring it up in Gospel Doctrine every year, if I have a chance, I, and I talk about it, because it, it brings a different... You're braver uh, than me, I can tell. Yeah, <laughs> it brings a different feel, because if the, the, the standard story, it's not that we care and want to be pedantic about, oh, it was a caravan, and she wasn't nine months pregnant. But, but the point is that when they come into Jerusalem, sorry, into Bethlehem, there are the Jews there who won't... Clearly she's pregnant, and they're not going to give her any, any space, and they're not going to make space for her. And so there's the there's that we just start with those anti-Semitic undertones that Jesus was born in the most humble of circumstances, very poor, in a in a shed somewhere. You know, it's and that's why the, actually the church's video just a, a year or two ago, everything I just said they incorporate that into the video. Hmm. Um, you know, they got that information from some of my my colleagues here at BYU, and you know. But there's some complications with him even, so if you really want to be provocative, there's, there's complications with him even being in Bethlehem. So some of the scholarship is that he was never there. They're from, and if you take all the Gospels and look at it and find out where the, the, the incongruities are, they're from Nazareth. Why are they in Bethlehem? Well, the standard answer is that there's a census in the days of Quirinius. There's no census mentioned anywhere. You know, Josephus doesn't mention, there's, there's no census mentioned anywhere. That's a big deal because that would have been so big where everyone was traveling in throughout the Roman Empire, going back to their ancestral lands to pay taxes. I mean, I mean a thousand they, years before. When they did censuses, did people have to travel for the census? Uh, not like that. Uh, to have, to have uh, how many million? So just six, six to eight million Jews. Like, forget everybody else. Just six to eight million Jews traveling on all the highways, going back to wherever town... Is that how big Jerusalem was back then, or, uh, or Israel? I guess I'm, we say. I'm using uh, data f from scholars who do demographic studies, and their estimate is six to eight million Jews in the Roman Empire. So it's in the diaspora, and it's also in Galilee. It's also okay. In, so that includes Italy and yeah, everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, so just that point alone is not. It's okay. I mean, there's there's no evidence of there's, but maybe they could have been there for another reason. And that's fine. Maybe they were in Bethlehem, but it's just scholars say it's a little bit suspicious because they want to tie, especially Matthew wants to tie Jesus to David, and David's from there, and you know, and so and Micah mentions this. So was prophecy. the census made up then? I think so in Luke. Yeah, I wow. think it's made up because Luke has to get. They have to have a reason for Jesus to be in Bethlehem. This is not so scandalous. I've heard, you know, our colleague Jeff Chadwick, who's an archaeologist, uh, and he, he does some Jewish studies stuff. He, you know, he studied at Hebrew University. He's one of our senior archaeologists here, and he wrote a book, uh, self-published a book called The Stone Manger. And he's very orthodox, and he teaches in religion. And even he says in his book, there's no, there's no census. It, it, it's, it's impossible. It can't happen. Um, so we, we don't have to throw out the story that Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem. But there is some scholarship. There are some complications for why they would be there. You know. Well, and it seems like most people who date the birth of Jesus ignore the census because it doesn't make sense. There's no evidence of it. Um, and so most people tie his birth to the death of Herod, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 4, 4 BC, 4 BCE. Uh, so Jesus would have had to been born 4 to 6, somewhere in that range. Uh, yeah. 
So that seems like a more reliable position. I mean, you know, we do, I've, I've had some other people say, well, as James Talmadge said, it was April 1 BC. A April 6 in, in 1, yeah, it's, uh, yep. Well, and the, the story there is, I, I think, somebody can correct me <laughs> in the comments or whoever, but I think it was uh, Dennis the monk, Dionysius the monk, right? Uh, I don't know the story, the history very well, but I do know that he's asked to change the Gregorian calendar to go to date back and start um, the year Jesus was born, you know, so that we can then count from Forward, there, right? Yeah. And so they, and they this is in the 1500s or something. Yeah, it's way late. I don't even remember seventh, yeah. uh, eighth, ninth century. Yeah, I don't think it's late as the 1500s, but yeah, they, they mess it up and they have they've won either one BC or one AD. And so now when I you know when I go to my class, it'd be always okay. When was Jesus born? You know, what what year? And they're confused. Like I don't, one year one or zero? How does that work? Like yeah. one BC to one AD? Like there is no zero. All right. So we go through the you know, so we just go through it just so they and this just adds a little bit of. I do these kinds of things not that it's a big deal. Uh, and again, like we're not trying to be pedantic, but I, I want to slowly get them to think a, a little bit deeper and use benign, like the Goliath thing, use benign issues. Uh, when what year was Jesus born? Just to get them to think about sources, about the complexity, and to appreciate, uh, you know, the time period and the data that we have. Well, this is I do have a very few evangelical listeners, um, you know, and this is a perfect example of when we say. They, they like to say the Bible is inerrant. <laughs> it's like, well, how can you... We don't even know when Jesus was born. Was it... Because if there was a census, I think it was like 4 AD, do you think? Yeah, there's there are six, four to six. There's yeah. some, some so census. So we're off by 10 years somewhere so, because the census clearly doesn't match Herod's death, right? Yeah, it doesn't match his death. Yeah, so it's, it's, with that census, uh, when was it? What it consist of? We have a problem. Yeah, we had a problem, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, um, yeah. What else? The oh, there's all there's all kinds of stuff with the the story. I, I discuss it in my book where you've got an idea of what is the star, you know, is this a star that they follow? And you know, there's a there's a case. And in, even in during that time period in the Dead Sea Scrolls and elsewhere, some believe that the star was an angel, a heavenly being that's going to come with the Messiah. And Josephus mentions even the later in the 60s during the war, he says that there was a star that appeared over Jerusalem. And it was a really bright star, and he says it, it got all the zealots riled up who were waiting for a Messiah because there was a star there. He said, and it messed everything, like it got them killed. And, but, and he said that star is based on an um, obscure prophecy. He doesn't say which prophecy, but it's the Bala'am, uh, Numbers 22 prophecy, where he comes, right, and he's, he's going to... This is this is the guy in the donkey, right? The, the I was numbers just twenty-two, say, right? You said, well, most of us say Balaam. Balaam, or you say Balaam. Balaam, yeah, the two, the double A yeah, in Hebrew, Balaam, okay. where he's looking over the valley when the Israelites are coming in, and he's supposed to curse them, but he can't. He can only bless them, and he says a star will come out of you know Judah, uh, you know, and so that later gets interpreted to be a messianic Davidic king, right? So. Okay. And so there's some passages that believe that it's a, it's an actual, it could be a star associated with Messiah, or that it's even in Dead Sea Scrolls, like an angelic, and even the Messiah himself will come as a star. So I mean, I'm putting all these uh, pieces together, and it could be that, uh, you know, it could be that they believed, you know, the star was put in there by Matthew, or they, it could be either one. Well, because it seems like, it's interesting that you say that some of the zealots saw the star, because... Most often, you know, the story is the wise men come to Herod, and Herod didn't see the star. Herod didn't know about the star. Oh, tell me about this star. And so it seems like most people, unless you're looking for the star, you don't see the star. Is is? But there were other people that saw the star? Um, at the time of Josephus. Um, but we have no record that they saw the star in 4 to 6 BC. Oh, and Josephus is some 60 years later then, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But he, but what we have with Josephus is we, and uh, who else? I think there's three people, maybe Philo. But there's two or three first century authors to mention this star. Not Jesus' a star, but that idea. It's Josephus and then Matthew. Um, and then um, I, think there's, I think there's a Dead Sea text that references Numbers 22 of a star that's going to come. And so there's, there's a third reference. 
so yeah, that idea is there, and people are using it, and um, it just depends on, you know, Mark doesn't use it, like it's not in Mark, so he's he's not he's not pulling in his traditions, um, you know, it's not in Luke, right? Luke has angels, but there's a big bright, you know, and so that's where it could be an angel, it could be a star, you know, in, in terms of in Luke's mind, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the Dead Sea sect, so. Because I don't, I'm trying to remember, I don't think the star is in Matthew either, is it? I think it is in Matthew. Oh, it is in Matthew? I mean, somebody can correct me, but I think, yeah. I think Matthew has the star because of the Davidic Messiah, Messianic reference. Um, and there's other interesting things. We, we can talk a little bit more about it, but, and this gets into what, if the, the Gospels are historically reliable. But in the book, if I can remember the references, there are... What Matthew wants to do is to show, and he does this over and over and over again, that Jesus is a Davidic king. And he, he, he ties him to David all the time. And in fact, if we get to it, I can open up my book and like go through and show numerous parallels. I can remember a lot of them off the top of my head, but uh, he does this all the time. And so that's his focus. He the son of David, or he's like David. And so he starts in the genealogy, and everything is about David. The name's in there, like I discussed this in the book, and then when they move to the birth scene, it's in, in Bethlehem with David. But the wise men, the, man, the magi, um, they're, they come with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and here's a Gentile, here's Gentiles who worship a son of David. All That's all throughout the Psalms. Psalms, you know, I, I, Psalms 9, I can't remember all of them, Psalm 72 maybe, uh, I could look them up, but there's about five different places where it says that in that day, the Gentile nations would come from the queen of Sh from the nation of Sheba or Sheba or whatever you want to say in English, and bring gold and frankincense, and in another place it says myrrh, and to worship Solomon. They're bringing it to Solomon, you know, and they're so you have foreign foreign enemies, foreign foreign nations coming to worship and bow down and give gifts to Israel's king, the son of David. In this case, it was Solomon in some of the Psalms. And so Matthew knows this, and so he's pulling all that in, and that's, that's where we get gold, frankincense, myrrh, and we have uh, Gentile royalty, people, you know, diplomats or royalty, whatever, coming to Bethlehem and then, you know, praising Jesus. He's the son of David, so that's why those elements make sense. It doesn't cast the whole story to make it false, but that's nowhere in any of the other Gospels. We know Matthew's focus is on David. We know Matthew is pulling in from the Hebrew Bible hundreds of times, and so it just makes you wonder, you know, how do we fit this in terms of scholarship, in terms of how we do the history? That's what, you know, historians raise that question. Yeah, and so that's what I loved about your book, was because you would pull in, I mean, there were so many references where, especially Matthew, was trying to pull in old scriptures and tie Jesus to those scriptures. Um, can you, do you have any more examples like that? He does it all throughout the the passion narratives. There are times where there's places like in Ezekiel and Zechariah that Matthew pulls in. Um, there are places where he's on the cross and he says, "Father, forgive them, they're not, they're not what they're doing," or um, "Why have you forsaken me?" A lot of that's from Psalm two, and it's and Matthew's pulling it in. Sometimes he's even quoting it. But like when he goes to the Mount of Olives, for example, there is. Um, Matthew's pulling in like you'll notice he'll say something like and some of the other Gospels do this too it's not just Matthew they'll say okay Jesus came to the Mount of Olives when he entered Jerusalem and got two donkeys okay that's in Genesis that's in, in Zechariah he comes down the Mount of Olives and they hold a parade for him they're yelling, yelling hail the King Messiah you know that's in 2 Samuel uh, with uh, Solomon having his coronation riding a donkey down um Man, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, Judas, we can talk about this later if we ever get to Judas, but Judas, it, it's only in Matthew where Judas kills himself. And then there's another place in Acts, so this is not the author of Matthew, this is the author of Luke, in Acts where he, he kills himself, but he slips and falls and his, his bowels spill out on the ground, right? So there's these two instances. Both of those, especially the one in Matthew, is in Second Samuel. Those are stories that are pulling in from Second Samuel. Uh, I don't know if you remember from the book, but what the short of it is, Absalom came, David's son came into Jerusalem. There's a conspiracy. He takes over the throne. David flees. His general, Ahithophel, joins the conspiracy. David um, overcomes that conspiracy. Ah, um, Absalom is killed. When David comes back into Jerusalem, the conspiracy fails. Ahithophel 
who conspired against the Davidic king um, kills himself, hangs himself. It's the same words as Judah. He, he says he went away and hung himself. The exact same words. Okay, so that, that they're pulling in from everything that Matthew's pulling in is from David. It's unbelievable when you when you go through and say, okay, is he pulling from the Psalms, which is attributed to David, or, or at least about David? Is he pulling from Second Samuel? Um, the other one, um, this is just very. Uh, this will just get us into you know into another rabbit trail of, of Judas, but we don't necessarily have to go there yet. But the other one in Acts, it says he fell on the ground and his bowels spilled out on the ground. Well, that is another one of David's generals of Amasa or Amasa, however we say it. He he also joined in the conspiracy. So he conspired against David, it failed, and then another of his generals, Joab, took revenge. He approaches Amasa, he grabs his face, calls him my brother, just like Judas says, my master, kisses him on the cheek, just like Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek, and he says that Joab is wearing a soldier's garment, okay, the soldiers are in Gethsemane, and then he sta Joab stabs Amasa uh, with a dagger, and it says his, his bowels spill out on the ground. So it's not an exact parallel because that doesn't happen to Judas or to Jesus in Gethsemane. But all the elements are there related to Judas. right? So the Matthew and then some, sometimes some of the other uh, writers are pulling in the Hebrew Bible all the time, everywhere. And so, because I've heard some, especially like seminary teachers that talk about the death of Judas and they, they're like, well, maybe he hung himself on a tree, on a cliff, and then the branch broke. Throw, yeah. and then he Throw spilled, his, yeah, yep. spilled his guts out on the ground or whatever. Yeah, that's a, that they've created a new episode. You don't see that episode. They're two different episodes. So we've created a third, a, a third episode. To reconcile. To reconcile it. And it's fine in terms of the history of interpretation. Uh, people need that to be historical. But that's... So you're saying that those two ways of death are not really compatible. And they're relying on two different New Old Testament stories. Yeah. And it, the Judas, man, this will get us hit. I don't know, if, if you want to talk about it now, we can, but the Judas episode is very, um, this is exhibit A for how things get really messy. And it, and so we can talk about, yeah, how these Let's different... Let's go there then. Um, it, it, there's so many, uh, 10 pages with tons of notes, so I won't remember everything, but it's, it's a fun discussion. Well, because you know, I've heard, and I don't know, maybe I'm making this up, but I've heard speculation um, that, you know, because we get into Judas, Judas is kind of the definition of anti-Semitism, right? He, he betrayed Jesus, and, and he's a horrible person. Um, but I know I heard somewhere where, Jesus said, one of you will betray me, and it was almost as if Jesus was saying, I'm going to pick one of you to betray me, and you need to do that. Not that, you know, because in the, in the Gospels it says the devil did Judas' heart, right, right, and, he, right. and he was worried about money and that sort of thing. And um, is that a reason? Because the, the story I heard was, you know, when Ju Judas leaves the room, nobody tackles him. Nobody's right. like, hey, i got to stop that guy. Right, right. <laughs> can, can, is, that a, is that a reasonable interpretation that Jesus asked Judas to betray him? That's one of the, the theories. And so when we go through, there's different, um, yeah, yeah, let's walk through it. There's a different, three different or four different, um, I guess, topics or uh, aspects of this Judas material. And then we can say, okay, what, as historians or scholars, if we're thinking like a scholar, how do we understand these three or four topics? The first one is what Judas's motive was. Like, what's his motive? There's, there, we don't have a, a clear answer. Like, there's no unified understanding in, in early Christian communities of what his motives are. Um, but essentially, these, these arguments are the theories, is that, and, and different Christians have different theories. Is n number one, we have to take the text at, what, at face value, and Judas was controlled by, overtaken by Satan or a demon. Another, and then Matthew says he was greedy, and that it caused, you know, and then, and then because of his greed, he was opened up to influence of Satan. So he, he was, uh, it was because of money. And then other, other commentators will say that um, it was his destiny to do it, his fate. You know, Jesus said, you will do this. And even in John, and my students don't like this, where they read John, once they're looking specifically at it, because John says that, and 
Christian theologians pick up on this, but John says that Jesus chose Judas because he knew that he would betray him. You know, he says, one of you, so you are my, my apostles, one of you is a devil. This is early in his ministry. The reason why my students don't like that, and one girl raised her hand, she says, I don't like that because it shows that Jesus, it, it implies that Jesus is just stringing him along. You know, like, what's the word for it? Uh, entrapment or something, right? It's entrapment. Like, I'm, I'm going to string you along and put you in, uh, in situations that where you're going, you have to betray me. That sounds, that sounds odd to me. I mean, I don't like that. I mean, it, it could be that Jesus did, but the implications of him just stringing Judas along because he knew he was a devil. So there's all those different um, there's all those Because different it aspects. turns Jesus into a manipulator, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, if he's going to have somebody do something that's, that has to be done to f fulfill some goal, kind of like Abraham. Abraham was asked to do this horrible thing, but, and he, he didn't end up doing it, but it exalted him. So he's going to ask Judas to do this, and then Judas is going to do it. And it's going to lead to his depression and death and, and his legacy, the disgraced, you know. So those are all the different things we wrestle with. But um, with, so his motives, we don't have an answer of, of why. Um, what happened to him after, we don't have a clear answer of what really happened. Because in Matthew, um, like Ahithophel, he went and hung himself. In Acts, he fell and, and his bowels gushed out on the ground. It, Papias, or Papias, however we want to say in English, a second century theologian, said that Judas got hit and he was hit and killed by a chariot. It was his divine punishment. And I think, if I, I might be wrong, but I think it's Papias who says that he was so bloated because of his wickedness, his body started growing and growing and growing and growing, and it was so big that a chariot couldn't get by and it hit him and he killed him. It was, you know, okay, so that's not the other stories. That's, that's a new story. It's <laughs> a new story, yeah. The, the chariot, you know, even if you take a realistic view, like the chariot hit him. Um, in the Gospel of Judas, the apostles excommunicated him and stoned him to death, if I remember correctly. So basically what we have in the first 100 years, or 100 to 200 years, maybe 100 years after Jesus' death, we don't have a unified understanding um, in, in Christian communities on why he did it, on what happened to him, you know, and in, in the aftermath. And so, and even Paul noticed, he, Paul doesn't mention anything like this. He doesn't say, oh yeah, Judas. In fact, Paul says after after Jesus was killed, he met with the 12. Okay, he, he, shouldn't he have said he met with the 11 minus Judas, if it was understood? You know, there's no hint. It doesn't mean he didn't know about it. He might not have just mentioned it, but there's well, no maybe hint. maybe Matthias had already replaced Judas? Hmm. Um, Probably not. I don't know. I don't, not, not, at the, not right when he showed up in the, you know, the 40 days, you know, yeah, when he was with them. Yeah. So um, the, I raise all those questions, and then my argument is, you know, and it takes 10 pages to get through the argument. My argument is that if Judas was like all of the other, many of the other Jews at the time, including Jesus' own followers, where Peter, in many instances, sees Jesus as a Messiah. And he says in Caesarea Philippi, you're not going to be killed. Like, what do you mean you're going to be killed? Like, basically, you're a Messiah. That's, that's, un, that's not going to happen. Um, in Paul, I think in 1 Corinthians, he says that the Jesus' death was a scandal on, a stumbling block for Jews. It's a scandal for Jews. This is why I'm, I'm having a hard time talking with Jews. So he goes out and he starts uh, bringing in Gentiles, which we'll talk about later, but um, he mentions, he knows that this is a problem for Jews, that a Messiah would die. Because the Messiah was supposed to become king and rescue become, become king, fight Rome, Jews do it, from Rome, yeah. Do all these things. And so I'm looking at the story, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Um, why would, and I tried to take every, every, uh, every theory, whether it's from Matthew or it's John or whether it's a Christian theologian. Okay, he's, he's, he's a money grubber, like he's greedy. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, he sold Jesus off for 30 pieces of silver, or whatever it was, 30 pieces, right? Okay, and then we, we can look and see what that's worth. That, that's the equivalent of $13,000 a year if you're making $40,000. You know, a, an average a laborer, you know, $40,000 a year, the, the equivalent would be, okay, this guy made around ten to $13,000 by selling his brother so to speak, his master, his teacher, off for the price of a slave. And even the bottle of ointment used in an earlier story to, uh, to anoint Jesus as, you know, when his feet were up on the Mount of Olives where somebody anointed him, or the woman anointed his feet. That bottle of ointment uh, is worth more than double that of the price of a slave. It doesn't make sense to me that Judas would just sell off, he would have to be mentally crazy 
to sell off your, your, your mentor and your teacher for such a low price. So that didn't make sense to me. Th these are the gospel writers trying to um, explain that these, these people weren't around Judas. Matthew, Mark, Luke, these guys were writing 30 or 40 years later, and they're trying to fill in the story, they're trying to understand, and they don't know why this guy did this and betrayed Jesus, and so they're putting motives in, in, in into Judas. So that doesn't make sense. Him being controlled by a devil, um, that doesn't make sense either. What makes sense to me is that he thought Jesus was the Messiah, like everyone else, and that he would be victorious. And so he wanted to arrange, like he was happy to arrange this meeting between Jesus and the chief priests, because he thought Jesus is going to win. But it, it makes sense in a messianic context. And even Matthew says that... So basically Jude, Jesus was just going to kill all the soldiers, basically? Yeah, this is his time to like, this is like the glad, finally, the gladi gladiatorial, like, like this is it. Jesus is going to, to do this. Um, I mean, we don't have strong evidence that obviously that Judas thought that. But all these other um, theories that are not congruous in the text just simply don't make sense. Because if he was, you know, unless he's literally crazy, because then he goes and he sells Jesus, and then when it's not till Jesus died where he realizes, oh no. And Matthew, in Matthew, it says he went to the temple establishment and he says, I sinned, I sinned against, what was the word? I sinned against my master, I sinned against this man. Well, the word, it's not sin as it, I did wrong, the word is I misunderstood. It's a misunderstanding. And I detail in the book the exact like, root word. So there's this, this context, uh, okay? I didn't realize it was going to happen. I didn't. I made a mistake, and he immediately had remorse. Like clearly, it wasn't like he slowly realized over time. Maybe I did something wrong. It was immediate. Oh shoot! Jesus is taken into the Sanhedrin. Pilate's going to get hold of him. He died. Now what? Like that. I, I didn't mean for that to happen. And so he goes and kills himself. I, I, I just. Uh, um, yeah, so I detail it in the, in the book in 10 pages. Hopefully that makes sense, to the, the gist of it. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Because I, I can see Judas thinking, oh, this didn't turn out the way I expected at all. Jesus was supposed to conquer, not be conquered, and now he's dead. I feel terrible. I mean, would you, would, do you think Judas would feel so bad that he would kill himself? Or is that just uh, the gospel writers saying, "Well, we need to pull in an Old Testament parallel, so we're going to." Yeah, it could be like we don't. That's the thing we don't even we don't even know. Nobody, Paul doesn't talk about it. Nobody's talking, and, and those who do talk about it all have different um, fates of Judas. So it could be, you know, in the in the, the, in the Last Supper setting where Jesus says, "One of you are going to," and by the way, we can't forget to talk about the word "betray." It doesn't mean betray. We're using that here, but when Jesus says, one of you is going to turn me over, it's paradokin, I think the word. One of you is going to turn me over. Um, and then it says that all the apostles were wondering who's it going to be. So it, so it almost sounds like Jesus is requesting them yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And then he says, and he, he says, Judas, you're going to do it, so do it quickly. And so then Judas leaves, and then it says all the apostles thought he was just going to go get food, or do, you know, it says he's going to go get food, or give some money to the poor, like do some alms or something, give some alms or something, like a ritual during Passover. Like he, he clearly he has somewhere to go, and it's not a problem. There was no hostility between Jesus and Judas, or between Judas and the other apostles. So even in these in individual settings, um, it's it's hard for me to imagine. Here's this this guy who, all of a sudden, is going to turn on Jesus. Uh, and the fact that Matthew's pulling in from Ahithophel, from Second Samuel, and from these other stories, and he's got uh, he's quoting Jeremiah, the thirty pieces, and the Potter's Field. All of that is from Jeremiah and Zechariah. All of those elements are of Old Testament, and then it leads to this guy's death, according to Matthew. But the word and uh, the, the word all throughout, you can take um, the Hebrew Bible, like the Septuagint, the Greek. You can take all of Josephus, all the classical literature of the word used for betray, and it doesn't mean betray. It means to deliver. It just simply okay. means to deliver. There's no, in fact, if... Uh, yeah, pull it out. So essentially, Judas, Jesus is saying to Judas, I need you to turn me over to the police, and I'll take care of the rest. And Judas is like, oh, okay, well, I trust you, Master. Right, yeah. That's it. That's, so here, let me just, I'll just read this little excerpt, just so we can... Okay, Mark does not refer to Judas as a betrayer. Um, Mark is the... Uh, Judas looks pretty good in Mark earliest gospel. Many English translations of the Bible use the word betray in reference to Judas, um, but the Greek paradin, it's not paradox, paradin, 
uh, in its various forms, means to hand over, to deliver, and not to betray. William uh, Clausen, scholar at uh, Cambridge, explained, quote, No one ancient classical Greek text has surfaced in which this verb means betray or has a connotation of treachery. Josephus, the most prolific historian of the first century, uses this word 293 times, but not once can one legitimately translate it employing the word betray. There is no linguistic basis in classical Greek, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, in Josephus, or patristic sources for a translation of betray to describe what Judas did. So, just right from the get-go, the very word, it just, you know, we, there's, there's other words to mean where someone would turn on, uh, turn on someone in Selimoth. Um I mean, the other angle is that the gospel writers want to, want to compare Jesus to Joseph of Egypt. There's four main, mainly, there's more than this, but it's four main characters that Jesus is often compared to. It's David and Moses, mostly. It's prophet Elisha and Joseph of Egypt. And so if you think of Joseph, he also was sold by his brothers. And who was the one of his brothers who was willing, it says he was willing to sell him for profit. It uses that word. You remember who, which, which brother? Judah. Judah. Well, that's Judah. Judas is the Greek form of Judah. So there's two Judas who are willing to both sell their, their brother or their master uh, for roughly the same at the price of a slave, two foreigners. Uh, see, it's, so it, there's some textual liberties, some license, there's some liberties going on because they have, they, they, this has to be, uh, you know, we have to get this right so that when we, these are missionary tracts they're taking out around the Roman Empire. And we have to, when people are reading this, they have to think, oh, Joseph or David or Moses or the prophet Elisha, right? So, not one piece of evidence is strong. Like we can't just say, oh, they're both Judah, therefore the whole thing's, like, it's just a made-up story. But if you take all of those data points, and then you bring in the messianic element, and what happened to Judas, and the word, what the word actually means, and um, the only thing we can say, is what I say in the book, like, in terms of a historian, is that there's some guy named Jew, Judah, named a Jew, whether that's a coincidence, is willing to sell his, or deliver, deliver his friend, and that's it. That's all we know. We don't know why. We don't know what happened to him after, because all the texts are different. So you think that he, that Judah, Judas could have been there when Jesus appeared 40 days later on the road to Emmaus? In terms of scholarship, if there was a Judas, if he was an apostle, if he delivered him, like, or, or whatever happened, yeah, I, I think he would have been there with, you know, unless, he, unless something happened to him. Because clearly something happened to him, and so then people are trying to explain, like, whatever happened to, that? Whatever happened to Judas? He was hit by a chariot. Oh, he hung himself. Oh, he jumped off a cliff. Something, yeah. He, he could have. He could have. Who knows what happened to him? But in terms of his motives, I'm, you know, it's not, it's not a strong, strong uh, theory, but I think it makes the most sense if he thought that, G that Jesus was a, a legitimate messianic candidate and then he just went and handed him over and then when it went south, like, you know, he freaked out. Anyway. Two ways I want to go here. Um, to me, there's a parallel with Peter uh, wh where Jesus says the cock, the crow is going to, the cock is going to crow three times, whatever. Um, and you're going to have to deny me three times before the clock crows. That's what it is. Um, so the question is, was Peter weak or was this another request of Jesus? Hey, I need you to lead my church after I'm gone. You have to deny me so that you're going to still be around. Is that a, is that a, a reasonable interpretation? Yeah, I mean, it's reasonable. Uh, it's, it's perfectly fine. Another interpretation is that Jesus didn't ask him to do it or didn't know that he was going to do it. Like Jesus prophesied, you're going to do this. It's possible that this is a later explanation. Because um, I think you said that Matthew was very anti-Peter, right? Yes, this would, this would get into a huge conversation, uh, discussion. But yes, basically what we have in the Gospels, and I detail it like every time Matthew mentions Peter, he, he kind of slams him or does little jabs or full on like you're Satan and you're going to be cast off to hell. Right. Over and over. It's in Matthew. So, yeah, when 
when that happens, you know, Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan, and he's, like, he's very zealous, and he wants to jump out and walk, but then he's faith, he has no well, faith, he, he sinks. And, the soldier's ear yeah, he's, he's erratic, he's, um, you know, he's, he's not, he doesn't come out looking good in Matthew. And if you, if you just isolate, take the other Gospels away, and then just take Matthew and say, every, show everything he's, like, saying about Peter, where, like, it says that he, okay, there's, there's one instance where a little kid is brought to Jesus uh, in Matthew, I think, 18, brought to Jesus, and then the apostles, and Peter's there, and they say, get this kid out of here. Like, don't bother Jesus. Then Jesus said, anyone who puts a, a, a barrier between me and the children is a scandal on. There's that word again. Scandal on is a stumbling block and should be put a millstone around their neck and should be cast. Like, they should die. Don't mess with the children. So what happens? The very next chapter in Matthew 19, another child is brought, and Peter does the same thing. The apostles and Peter does the same thing. And it's, I think, Matthew, and then there's the, oh, let me back up. There's a, a parable that Jesus gives probably 10 chapters before that, and that is the seed that he, they plant, right? It falls like in the rocks, and, it, it, and it's, it springs up, right? That, the rocky ground, all of those words, rocky ground, uh, kephas, this means rock or stone, and it's Peter, right? Right. Um, you have the word scandalon, a stumbling block, in that parable also. And so some think, like Mark Goodacre and others, think that that parable in Matthew is about Peter because he does this. It says those who are zealous, they spring up, and, you know, and then they lose faith. That's exactly what Peter's doing all the time. He's all, he gets really zealous. He's like, oh, I will never betray you. And then Jesus, and then Jesus says, yeah, you will. And like, you know, Jesus tells the, the apostles to stay awake when he goes into Gethsemane. He comes out. They're all asleep. But he doesn't address all of them. He turns to Peter and he says, have you no faith? And he's like, Peter does it three different times. Every single time, um, he just get, Matthew just blasts him. And then there's the, the denial, denying three times. In Matthew, uh, the author of Matthew says that Jesus in that gospel says, do not swear an oath. Do not oath take. Especially not with people you, you shouldn't be doing it with. And so when that very setting, when Jesus is inside refusing to take an oath with uh, Caiaphas, at that same time Peter is outside and he says he takes an oath and he denies Jesus. You know, and, and, and then in other places it says that those who take an oath will be uh, cast off to hell. Like there's all this language that if you know, in, if you look at what's happening in Peter and the language and Jesus says, and then you trace all those same words and those same settings and all the way throughout the gospel, you know, like every single place that Jesus is mentioning, those who do certain things, they're going to be cast off to hell and there's going to be weeping and wailing. That's always Peter. <laughs> right? So there's a reason why I get into my book, there, there's a reason why, and we can talk about it a little bit later in, in a segment, but why Matthew does not like Peter. Because then what I do is I bring in Luke. I say, okay, what is Luke? We're assuming that Luke is written after Matthew. This is a debate, huge debate in, in biblical studies of which one came first. But Mark Goodacre, a Duke who's a synoptic problem scholar, he's, he's arguing, I think in a recent book that is coming out, that Luke um, came after Matthew. Because what you can see is where every time where Matthew criticizes Peter or makes him look bad, Luke comes along and touches it up. He either removes Peter or he moves, you know, he doesn't call him Satan, like every single time. And he's trying to soften that view of Peter. So, yeah, the, it's the, they're fun topics. And, you you know, my, some of my reviewers are like, man, that's, like, how do we, I don't like that. Like, how do we, why, why should we revere Peter then? Like, you're, you're destroying the entire foundation of the Christian church. I'm like, well, it's not, not, I'm not really saying that. I'm just saying that that's what Matthew is saying. I'm not saying Jesus actually called him Satan and said he's going to be in hell. That's what Matthew is saying that Jesus said. The author of Matthew, right? So. Well, because there's another story about um, that I've heard that Jesus' brother James was the leader of the early Christian movement. Yeah. Um, and the implication is, and I'm trying to remember, I think I get my stories mixed up. I believe it's the story where Paul and Peter are having an argument about circumcision and they go to James to uh, solve the argument, I, I believe. And so that kind of makes it sound like James is in charge of the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His very, yeah, his very, you know, brother. So, 
And, 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 you know, when you think about it, his brother would make a lot of sense, right? Because he's the brother of Jesus. Why wouldn't he be in, why would Peter be in charge? So was James the original leader and not Peter? I mean, it certainly looks that way in, um, in Acts, in Acts 15. Um, do you want to, do you want to do that? Okay. There, do you want to talk about the Jerusalem Council and that whole issue? Yeah, let's do it. Because, and there's why this is important. This is, de- this is one chapter that I'm going to write an academic book in terms of four scholars. I, I deal with it in one chapter of this book. I'm going to expand it to an entire book and go deep and, and cover, overturn every stone to argue this. But my argument is, um, and it takes me an entire class period with my students to show them what happened starting in the 50s to the 70s. It was continuing in the 70s. This generation is when the Gospels were written. What was going on during so that generation? So you're saying it's earlier because most people say it's more like 90s to 110, right? That's pretty late. Um, but 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it could, even if it's in the 90s and 110s, um, I mean 110s, that's pretty late. That's when the Gospels actually start showing up in early Christian literature. In the 110s, 110s to 120s. So there's got to be more time for was them to circulate. Was it more of an oral tradition in the 60s then, do you think? Or was it written down that early? Uh, I think it's possible that it was, at least Mark was put down in the 60s when the war was going on because there's all kinds of evidence that the temple's was destruction. He's, he's referring to the desolation of sacrilege. Um, you know, and there's, so most people want to date it to the 60s. But even if it was in the 70s or 80s, that's the generation in which the Gospels are written. So my question in the book is what was going on in that generation that influenced the writing of the text? And it's exactly what you're talking about, this debate. In fact, I think I've got... you mind if I read? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Because this explains... This is, one of my, I, I, this is a quote from one of my friends, Gary Rensberg, who actually wrote a chapter in that other book that, I, that we didn't okay. mention. We can talk um, about that later. Where is it? Where is it? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this this is Gary Rensberg. He's a Jewish scholar at Rutgers. And I just threw this on some notes because I, I think this will explain. This will help. This is what I read to my students. He's talking about the book of Genesis. But it's an analogy, and it, it pl- applies perfectly to the Gospels. And he's, he, he's arguing that Genesis was written much later than um, the time of David, even the time of David. But... Here's how he's, he explains it. And we can just substitute the Gospels. Genesis in was, was written after King David? Way after, yeah. Okay. We're talking about 600s, even 500s. And there's, there's lots of crumbs in the text, left in the text, uh, different words uh, that are contemporary to that time period, uh, different uh, references that would have been placed earlier. Anyway, there's lots of different ways scholars date it. At least Genesis' final form. Wait a minute. That's after Lehi, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, after Lehi. Yeah. Earlier, there's earlier, so even Isaiah... Even first Isaiah references, I think, Sodom and Gomorrah or Abraham. So these traditions, they probably know about these. But in its final form, final redacted form, we're talking exilic period after, right? And that's the, and that's the argument that he makes. And um, I've got whole lectures on that, too. It's, it's, it's fun. It's pretty compelling. But here's, what he, here's how he explains it. He says, scribes wrote, so in this, you could, you could substitute that with the authors of the Gospels. Scribes wrote a national epic incorporating all of the earlier traditions back to Abraham and embedded into that narrative anticipations of the present. So, so he says, that is to say, there's a social, religious, and indeed political message in the book of Genesis. And then he says, okay, or in, he says, or in other words, these scribes tell the story about the past but reflect upon the present. This was a major accomplishment of the anonymous authors in Jerusalem who created the book of Genesis. Or in this case, gospel writers who who wrote their gospels. This technique is well known in world literature. Take, for example, from film, the movie MASH, the TV show, but there's also the movie, written in 1969. It tells the story of American American troops during the Korean War. But as all who see that film know, in essence, it is about another land war in Asia, the one still raging at that time in 1969, which was Vietnam. The anti-war pro-peace stance of the lead character Benjamin Franklin Hawkeye Pierce reflects the present, which is the late 60s, but is anachronistic for the early 50s. See? So, and that's the case, I just want to read, I share that all the time because it, when someone says, are the Gospels historical, or historically reliable, I say yes, really reliable, in the time period in which they were written, for that time period, the 60s, 70s, 80s. 
And so the argument goes, and I can give you, I'll just get this, there's a few references I want to mention, but basically here's the argument. When Jesus died in the late 20s, sometime, you know, all the way until the 50s, what was happening to the, to the movement? Well, James is in Jerusalem. This is, this is a Jewish group. And then sometime in that time period, Paul, joined, who's a Pharisee, joins the group, joins the movement. And then he goes out and he starts, he takes the gospel to every nation, right? Like this is Jesus' charge. He goes out. The problem is that it takes 20 years for this debate that you mentioned that we'll bring up again occurs. The debate comes up because he's converting Gentiles in Corinth and like in other places, in Greece, in Rome. He's converting them, but they're not moving to Jerusalem. They're staying there. So there's not this interaction between Jews and Gentiles until later, right? Okay, so what happens is there's this time period, there's this, there's this event around 50 where in Antioch, up in Syria, Paul happens to be there, and then Peter and Barnabas are there. This is in, Ge- this is in Galatians. And they're, they're, they're going to have a meal, and Peter and Barnabas sit with Jews, the Jewish followers of Jesus, and Paul is sitting with the Gentile, the non-Jewish followers of Jesus, and he's furious because they, they won't eat together, they separate, and Peter's eating with those people, and he calls Peter and Barnabas hypocrites. Okay, so what does this sound like? You've got a mill. A mil. You, you have two groups not wanting to sit together because of purity reasons. You have um, one person calling another person a, a hypocrite, like what Pharisees were called. And it's, a, it's like this it's a mealtime setting. That sounds like the Gospels. All those settings where Jesus is eating with Pharisees and they're having this discussion on whether outsiders should come in and be welcomed into the group. Okay? So you have that setting, and that raises a question. Like everything hits the fan, it comes to a head. We need we need to go to Jerusalem and discuss this. This is really the first time where this this blew up. So they go to Jerusalem, and in Acts 15, the question is: Should people who who are non-Jewish be required to become Jews, convert to Judaism in order to be a member of the Jesus movement? Right, that's the question. Right. Um, Paul stands up and he says, "These Gentiles." only have to be immersed. That's the only part of, of the Jewish system, like to be immersed. That's it. James stands up and says, well, they, yeah, they don't have to be circumcised. They have to be immersed. But they also, and he quotes Leviticus 17 and 18, and he says they also have to follow some other laws, like important laws, Jewish laws. No eating um, the meat from an animal that was sacrificed to an idol, no eating, uh, no, no drinking any blood of an animal. You can't eat from an animal that was strangled. Like these are like embedded right in Leviticus. And then also uh, sexually pure. You can't engage in fornication. So they have to be immersed, and they do have to follow these key, these ver- these key aspects of Jewish law. The analogies today, the word, of, the word of wisdom, we do the same thing. We say members have to come in, and they have to have no alcohol, no ta- tobacco, no coffee, no tea. That's not the word of wisdom. Those are just the things that we've pulled out of the Word of Wisdom and we are, that mean the most important to us. They're boundary markers for being a Latter-day Saint. For James, that's, that's those aspects, right? So then you have, do, do you know, if you, if you asked Latter-day Saints, i even ask you, who's the third party? Who's the third person or the third party that stood up and gave their position? They, 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 they got the floor, they got the microphone, and they got to give their position. Do you know, do you remember? You're talking about this Jerusalem Council? The Jerusalem Council. After Paul, after James, somebody else stood up and got... After James? Yeah. What, not Peter? No, Peter's probably with James, like okay. like the way that Peter... Because what I remember is, yeah, it's the showdown between Paul and Peter, and I thought they went to James and said, what do you decide? And James agreed with Paul. In Acts 15... The Pharisee followers of Jesus stand up and they give their position. And so we'll talk about the Pharisees in a, in a minute, but this is one piece of evidence that I think the Pharisees and Jesus were very close, very cordial. Not all Pharisees, but the Pharisaic system and the Jesus movement came out of the Pharisaic system, or they were Pharisaic type Jews. They followed the Pharisaic rulings. Okay, This is one piece of evidence. The Pharisees... and it, the reason why I think the Pharisees had a seat at the table and were, were given a, a, 
you know, the microphone, I keep saying the microphone, so to speak, <laughs> is because they had a, they, they had a sizable following of Jewish exclusive Pharisee followers of Jesus. So what do they say? They say, no, they have to be circumcised, they have to be immersed, and they have to follow the entire law, the whole law. And the Greek word used for that council is stasis. It's a, it means like, it's translated dissension or, or it's like, but basically that word means riot. There's a riot. Um, because when they side with Paul and they say, yeah, you're right. We don't, they don't have to become Jews. They just have to be immersed. This alienates both the, and even, it even alienates Peter who's, 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 and James who are the Jerusalem Jewish faction of the Jesus movement. And it alienates the Pharisaic aspect, the Pharisaic sector, right? The group. Because they wanted them to be circumcised. Because they were Jews. I'm like, this is a Jewish, they're saying this is a Jewish movement. And let me just give you some references because I put them down here. So uh, I didn't want to forget. So in Leviticus 10, it says, you are, to, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean. Pharisees are followers of Jewish law. Okay, so they're thinking, we can't just have Gentiles come in and bring all of their pagan impurities and their, their culture of idol worship, and they're not, they're not following Jewish law, so they're going to contaminate an impurity. When we sit down and eat or when we're in our, you know, in our meetings, uh, in our houses, like in the mealtime symposia, the, the mealtime setting, um, we can talk about that, but they're going to contaminate everything. In Genesis 17, it says, according to Gen um, uh, in Genesis, uh, I just pulled some from text from this, it says, um, God commanded, in Genesis 17, God commanded all of Israel to be circumcised. He also commanded all male foreigners who wish to enter the covenant to be circumcised. It's foreigners. Otherwise, they shall be cut off from this people. The Pharisees also know that. In Exodus 12, it says that any foreigner residing among covenant Israel who desires to participate in Passover and eat with Israelites must be circumcised. This is, this is the entire Pharisaic and Jewish way of life. Ever since the days of Jesus, like 20 years ago, we've been, we were a Jewish group. We followed Jewish law. Even after Jesus died, you have all of the apostles in Acts going to the festivals, celebrating on the Jewish Sabbath. Paul in Acts 21 goes and sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. This is after Jesus died. They're still living Jewish law. The Pharisees are living Jewish law. This is a Jewish group. And the minute they decided to side with Paul, that um, now this is like a strange conglomeration of... Like, you, when you say they, you're saying that James and Peter sided with Paul and said they don't need to be circumcised. They evidently, yeah, they, they eventually sided with... Aired, you know, they, they leaned towards Paul's side. For Gentiles, not for Jews, other Jews. Right. Right? And so... It infuriates the, the Pharisees. The reason why I bring all that up is because then if you go look in the letters of Paul that post-date this council in 50 CE, he's furious because he, he says, like in Galatians and other places, he says, these people from Jerusalem, these circumcised people, he's talking about Jesus believers. They keep, they keep beating me here and they keep coming here and telling you to be circumcised. He says, I, and in one place in Galatians, I think it's Galatians, he says, I hope they slip at the knife and accidentally castrate themselves. He's furious. He calls the, the, the Jerusalem apostles, he calls them false apostles. The, you know, he says, he doesn't say James and Peter. He says the leaders in Jerusalem are false. They're so-called apostles. Right? Then in there's, <clears throat> there's some other places where Paul, and in, like in Corinthians and some other places where Paul says, he's speaking to a crowd and he says, look, you guys are following after Peter, and you guys are following after me. And he he, he says some of Apollos. Yeah, he yeah. he he's saying that there are factions. We know that there are factions. We know he's furious. And then in some of his letters, he says it's strange because he says, "Guys, I didn't go to Jerusalem. I've never been. To, I did go to Jerusalem for one time, and when I was there, I only stayed for 15 days, and I never met with the apostles. That's strange. Why why is he saying that? Unless he unless a, a, a big a rift happened between the Gentile inclusive faction of the Jesus movement who were fighting against the Jewish exclusive faction of the Jesus movement. And when Paul's now traveling around after that decision was made and Pharisees and or Peter and James and others, 
probably the Pharisees who are mad about this as well, they're, they're also going out around and they're telling people you have to be circumcised. And Paul's like, no, they keep coming from Jerusalem and telling you this. They don't, you don't have to be circumcised. And they're so-called apostles. And I, and I didn't go, I didn't, haven't talked to them. I didn't get my gospel from them, he says. I didn't get my gospel from them. And my question in the book is, why is he, why is he saying that? Why is he trying to reassure his Gentile audience that he didn't get his gospel from them, he hasn't associated with them, he never goes to Jerusalem, and, and when he went to Jerusalem, the one time he only stayed for 15 days and didn't meet with the apostles. It's because he knows that there's, this rift has become so bad that his Gentile followers of Jesus don't like the original apostles. That's become so um, uh, contentious, right? And so the discussion we had earlier about why Matthew criticizes Peter over and over and over again in his gospel. That's because Matthew's written after the Jerusalem Council, when all of this is raging, he slams the two main people that he criticizes, Matthew, uh, are the Pharisees and Peter. Why would he do that? Because he's a Pauline Christian. He's siding with the Pauline. Like, yes, he's writing to Jews, and yes, he's pulling in David and Moses and everything. But all throughout the gospel of Matthew, he's showing that Gentiles have it. The Magi come. They're Gentiles. There's one place where Jesus uh, meets a centurion, and he says, you are as faithful as I've ever seen. Right. No one in Israel has your faith. And it's just over and over. Like, there's a Gentile woman that shows up, and Jesus says, you know, you have great faith. And, and Pilate. Pilate looks amazing in the Gospel of Matthew. Which, I wash my hands. Yeah, well, we'll, you guys that wanted to kill we'll Jesus. We'll talk about Pilate, but why is it that the the gospel that is Pauline, in, in my argument, that's, that's, that's pro-Gentile, he's a Gentile inclusive faction, who's giving a nod, hat tip to all of the Gentiles. They have all this faith, and it's Jews and Pharisees who are just rotten. They're going to be in hell. That's because it's written after the Jerusalem Council in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whenever it's written, when this debate is raging between Pharisees and between and, and the, the other Jewish exclusive faction and the Gentile inclusive faction. Now, can you explain to me, because this just seems so foreign for Christians, I guess, um, why is it that Jews would not eat with Gentiles? Because... Like, I've eaten dinner with Jews before, and it was maybe they were bad Jews. I don't know. But, but it seems very discriminatory or something in our modern lens. But in the, the days of Jesus, it was a, more of a purity thing. Is that why? Yeah, it is. So, the, the, and this is, a, this is an important, what you're asking me now is an important key, an important point for my argument that I can make later on what happened um, that the Pharisees and G the Jesus movement were very cordial and we don't see that rift until after. Like you have the parting of the ways between the Pharisaic followers of Jesus and then the Pharisees in general and the Jesus movement. Um, so the, one of the key aspects of that relationship, if we go back into the days of Jesus, into the late 20s, is this mealtime Symposia. Like, right. what is this? There's the Greco Roman, the philosophers did this. They would eat together and they would have a symposium where they would debate the, philo the philosophy. Like, they would have philosophical debates. But they're not meeting with their opponents. This is an, uh, an in house, uh, this is a community a friendship where the philosophers, you know, debate. It seems like there's a, an old Jewish saying that says if, um, if you have two Jews, meet together, you'll get three arguments. Three, yeah, three opinions, three <laughs> arguments. That, that, that is the story of, of early Judaism and rabbinic. The, the entire rabbinic lit, corpus of rabbinic literature, the Talmud, the Mishnah, all this is one long debate. It says this guy debates this, these two debate this, and the, the, the rabbis finally had to come to this decision. It's all over the place. So the Jews, the Jews adopted this practice where you have this, um, especially the Pharisees, where you have this mealtime symposia, and Ben Sira and other, other um, Jewish texts talk about this. And so we can add the, the Gospels, we can add these other Jewish texts. The Mishnah, that's the early Jew, earliest rabbinic text, postdates Jesus by like maybe 100, 150 years, talks in detail about these settings. What happens is you would get uh, these people together, 
they're, they're from the same community, like-minded, and they would have guests of honor. And they would bring a guest of honor, and they would sit at a t- table, and you would, and uh, you, this is in the the Last Supper, like this, this is in the New Testament as well. But they would, the guest of honor would sit, and then you'd go in descending order. Like your best students would be closest to you if you're the host, and they would go in descending order. This is why Jesus says, if you go to the, the mealtime, you don't sit up at the top, because then you might, you don't sit by the host, because then you'll look foolish if he tells you to move down. Sit at the lowest, and then he can tell you to move up. The last shall be first, you know, those kinds of things. Like he is humble, will be exalted. So the the symposium was you would eat, and before you would eat, you would have some sort of purity. You would either dip in the mikvah oat, it, it, one, of the, one of the mikvah oat, the mikvah, or you would wash, the host might wash their feet and their hands. He might anoint their head with oil. Uh, it's just whatever the host wants. And there's practices of this. And we know, so Jesus does this all throughout, the, not all throughout, but some places in the Gospels, especially the Last Supper, he does this. He washes their feet, and he talks about being cleansed and being washed. That's a pre-meal uh, ritual. Then you would eat with friends, and then after, you would debate the law. If you understand that, you can see how when Pharisees, like four or five times in Luke, are inviting Jesus to, as a, as a guest, an honored guest, to their mealtime, what do they do? They eat, and then they debate. And what do they usually debate? What do we do with people who've removed themselves from outside the house of Israel? Tax collectors, prostitutes, like all these people, like non-Jews, and then Jews have removed themselves out who are not living the law. They've removed themselves from the covenant of the house of Israel. What do we do with those people, Jesus? That debate comes up all the time. Like there's five or six different times where the debate comes up in that in the mealtime setting and then also in other settings. It's the same debate all the time. So if Jesus did have debates with Pharisees, that was the debate. And Pharisees are saying, in fact, let, let me just show you, I'll just, just so everybody has the, the references. Um, let's just, I mean, I could quote off that. Okay, so the Pharisees asked Jesus, this is in Luke 7 and Matthew 11. They asked Jesus, you, you're bringing these people in. Are you a friend of these people? These, these sinners? Sometimes you use the word sinners. Other times it's, yeah, it's other times it's like these, uh, these, these other like prostitutes. Like there's different words, but usually it's sinners. Are you friends with them? This is, this is in line with what we learned from the Mishnah and from other texts, that this is a friendship group. This is not a hostile. Pharisees didn't invite Jesus to dinner so they can entrap him and, you know, and like try to kill him. They invited him over and over and over because they see him as an ally. But they're confused by Jesus bringing in these like people from outside the house of Israel, like Gentiles and other, or even if they're Jews, they're like tax collectors, which means they're like gangsters. They, ex- they extort money. They engage in tax farming. They're handling money, which is impure. There's images on, imprinted on the money, so there's idol worship. This is why tax collectors are so, um, you know, they're, they're rejected. So that's the debate over and over and over. And there is, let me just show you. Okay, here's the wisdom of Ben Sira. I pulled, I pulled this just so, so that your listeners could hear it. This is a 2nd century BCE text. Let your conversation be with men of understanding, and let all of your discussion be about the law of the Most High. Let righteous men be your dinner companions, and let your glorying be in the fear of the Lord. Do not reprove your neighbor at the banquet of wine, and do not despise him in his merrymaking. Speak no word of reproach to him, and do not afflict him by making demands of him. Some scholars think that the wisdom of Ben Sira is written by a Pharisee. It's, it's, it's very Pharisaic. I don't know if we can say that for sure, but it's a Jewish text predating Jesus that, that talks about this issue, like talks about this setting. And it even says, let your uh, dinner companions be righteous men. That is the, the most common word used in Josephus about Pharisees, righteous. Dikaios uh, and Eusebia. Righteousness toward God, righteousness toward their fellow man. This defines um, Pharisaism. So... Um, I just bring that up because that's, um, that's if Jesus is eating with Pharisees over and over and they're having these discussions with him, they're expected to debate. This is not the same kind of relationship that Jesus has with the temple establishment. Like Latter-day Saints and Christians in general just lump all of, they, they assume that everything is negative. Every question, unless a Pharisee says, Master, and then Jesus answers, and then the Pharisee says, okay, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're great, you're a holy man. Outside of those, every single episode is assumed to be negative. And we just lump Sadducees, priestly establishment, Pharisees in one, one basket of people who want to entrap Jesus and get him killed. Uh, that's not the case. So, um, anyway, we, 
we'll talk about the Pharisees, and this might come up again, but um, let me ask you, does this, when we're talking about the Jerusalem Council and parting of the ways and the nuances about how all of that played out, and then all of the Gospels were written with that in mind, the Gospels are written with these, these mealtime symposia, where Jesus is, with Pharisees, debating the very thing that they were debating in the Jerusalem Council and in Antioch when Paul and Peter were eating with, you know, separate. Does that make sense to you, that uh, the Gospels are written with that, um, you know, that rift? Because all throughout the Gospels, they're eating together and the, the same thing comes up. Uh, a Gentile woman approaches Jesus in a mealtime setting, and he says, um, I've, I've not come to Gentiles, I've only come to Jews, so I can't, I can't deal with you. And so, so then she falls on her knees and she, you know, she's like, please. And then she says, okay, okay, you great. Dogs up from the table, right? Yeah, it's like Matthew, is that a Matthew? Where, where, I think that's in Matthew. Again, here's the writer of that gospel trying to make a political point against Pharisaism. Putting it back on Jesus, saying, Jesus welcomed Gentiles, even when he said he was coming to teach Jews, like when it mattered, especially in relation to the Pharisees, like he's in saying, in, like invite them in. So it's funny because I, I've always heard that s scholars say that this Jerusalem Council is a big deal, but you don't get that at church. Like it's just. Jesus was born, the Gospels, they all agree, and then they have this council, and goes to the Gentiles, and that's why everybody can be a Christian now. <laughs> I mean, that's right. Um, and so, so to answer your question, no, that, like, I've always wondered why this Jerusalem Council was such a big deal to scholars, because normally we don't talk about this, this rift. Um, we... I don't. I didn't. I don't even think we recognize it as a rift of the Jewish Jesus followers versus the Gentile Jesus followers, um, and um, you know because especially in the LDS culture we're very correlated. Well, of course, this is just the way things happened, and those people were wrong, and who cares about what they think? <laughs> so, so we don't see that as kind of a civil war. I mean, would you say that's almost a civil war in oh, yeah. Christianity? If you put all the pieces together and you see how mad Paul is, you see the word used, stasis, for, as a riot that broke out in the Jerusalem Council. You see how the Gospels are, they turn on Pharisees, which yeah. we'll talk about in a minute. They, yeah. like, everything... So we should, we should make that more central. The, the problem is... We like to follow a nice timeline, and God's in charge, and you know the star came, and the wise men came, and Jesus was born, and then he was twelve, and preached, and and then of course the Pharisees were wrong, and so you know the gospel goes to everybody. I mean that that's the typical story, and I and I, I don't think that's just LDS. I think that's all of Christianity. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's not even just. A major thing for scholars. Like when I put this research together, I, I, I was doing something else. Like I was talking about, uh, and I was trying to, I wrote my master's thesis on the Pharisees. So I was already thinking about these issues. And, and this will, guys, I guess will transition us to the, to the issue about the Pharisees. But it, something didn't make sense to me. And I was trying to figure out why, like whatever happened, like why did Matthew, especially Matthew, just demonize Pharisees so hard. Right. He's coming so strong. Something happened. Because the way I'm seeing Pharisees and Josephus and everywhere else is not, and even in the Gospels, it's not, it's not warranted. I don't, I, so I started check, looking into why this is the case, and I was digging up all the research, and some scholars would dabble in like the Jerusalem Council. You look at the commentaries, and it's just skimpy. Like, it's, it is talking about who the different positions are, and the question is whether Gentiles should be convert. Like, that's all there, and scholars know that. But I couldn't find any Christian scholars, very few. Um, there was one scholar who had a very small book where he was talking about this rift and why Peter, whether, whether the gospel writers, Peter was a, a failed apostle or something. Like there, Few people are talking about it. But I, I didn't find anyone who was making a robust argument that, you, if, that the gospels were written in a context after the Jerusalem Council during that civil war between the Jewish exclusive followers of Jesus and the Gentile inclusive followers of Jesus. So even, even Christian scholars who were trained in, in who 
you know, they, they don't, that's not, um, that doesn't work for many of them because they don't want later writers to make political points and putting it and sticking it back on the 20s, you know, the 20s when Jesus was alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Trevin Hatch. We're not done with him yet. We're going to continue to talk about the Pharisees. And uh, Dr. Hatch has some amazing uh, insights into Pharisees. We take Matthew, who's on purpose trying to slander Pharisees for a reason, and we run with that. The story doesn't make sense. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.